Today we're going to talk about elections, electoral systems, the rules by which parties and candidates compete in elections, how they compete for our vote, how we vote, and most importantly, how our vote is translated into seats in a legislature, or a victory or a loss for the candidate. Robustly competitive elections are essential to a vital democracy, so this is, this is a pretty important topic. Now, when we think of elections, we often think, we tend to think that the elections in our own society are the natural way of organizing things, perhaps the best or only way. Of course, that's not true. And you start realizing that once you look around and see that other countries um, do it in very different ways. So let's compare. And this is the power of political science. You collect knowledge from in our case, a good chunk of the world across the, the transatlantic ocean. And then we collect that and then we sit back and compare and use the acquired knowledge we have to make more informed assessments of what we think is good and what can be improved in our system as well as that from in others. Very good. And, you know, the electoral system is uh, so vital in terms of the overall character of the political system. So when I think about um, Britain and the, uh, and the United States, uh, their electoral system is very distinct from that of uh, the continental European um, countries in, in, um, in general. Um, and there are two basic um, systems um, of, uh, of electoral transformation of votes into seats, into, into office. And the first is called the plurality electoral system. It's the first past the post. The candidate that gets at least one more vote than any other candidate in that constituency gets elected. It doesn't matter what percentage of the vote um, you get. It's like a horse race. The first horse, that is the, the horse that, uh, that wins the race. And it's, it's the system we know best because it's our home system. It's also the... The, the system that dominates in most of the Anglo-Saxon democracies, including Britain, Australia, um, India and as well, Canada, yes, exactly, and the occasional European country like France. Yes, and then um, the alternative system is called PR, proportional representation. It does uh, really what the name suggests; it's proportional, and that is a political party receives exactly the share of seats that it gets in the popular vote. So if a, if a party is supported by 10% or 20% of the electorate in the election, it will then get in the legislature 10 or 20% um, of, the, um, of the seats. And where does that um, take place? Well, in most of the continental uh, European um, countries. So I think these are such disparate, such logically different systems um, that you as an American you might have regarded your own system as commonsensical as normal um, as something you don't really consider very uh, very much but I think after this lecture you'll really uh, have a very different view about your system because um, comparison really shows you just how unusual things are that you had previously perhaps taken for, um, for granted. So we're going to take you on a, a, a journey where we're going to try to think mm. through logically the implications of these different electoral systems. And let's start with the one that we know best, the first past the post or plurality system. So think along with us. Um, now, the um, plurality electoral system is, we think it's normal, but actually it's very strange. And what I'm going to do is now I'm going to ask you a question which will reveal how kind of unusual it is and it's an arithmetical question um, and the question is as follows uh, what is the smallest think about the smallest possible share of the vote that a party needs to get in a plurality electoral system to win a constituency if there are three parties contesting the, the election now in the United States there are normally two parties but sometimes there are three parties the Green Party is going to be contesting in some constituencies. Now, this is a logical question. What's the smallest share of the vote that a candidate could win if there are three parties, three candidates 
contesting um, the election. I'm going to give you a few um, moments to consider that and, um, and then we'll come up with the um, answer. As little as 34% of the vote. So a party could actually win, a candidate could win in a constituency if it received 34% of the vote and the other two candidates received 33% uh, percent each. That's the logic of the system. It doesn't often happen, but you see how the system operates in terms of its uh, core, um, core logic. Now, there's one I want to extend this question. And let's think about a legislature. Let's imagine that, say, the legislature had 100 seats. So what is the smallest possible share of the vote that a party needs in a plurality system to have a majority in the legislature to get 51 of those 100 seats, a majority in the legislature, if there are three parties contesting the election? I'll give you a few moments and, um, and uh, see if you can... I come up with the right answer. The answer is 17% of the vote. It's 17%. Now, if you've got 17% of the vote, I mean, perhaps you should be in another course or a graduate course. <laughs> Um, many professors would not actually have um, given that precise answer. It's around 17% of the vote. Um, but you would have to, it's an arithmetic um, question, so you'd have to actually apportion the votes for the other two parties in exactly the same, exactly the correct way to arrive at that. And here is a, uh, here's how it works. So let's go through this and, um, and, and figure out how this, how this works. So where would you want to, you know, you could think about where the vote should be if you're just getting 17%. Well, in 51 seats, those are the seats you want to win. Those are the seats where if you win those seats, you're getting a majority of the legislature. And what, you, what do you need in each one of those seats? Well, there are three parties. If, if, if the red party gets 34% in the first seat and the blue party gets 33%, and the grey party gets 33%, you win that seat. And the same thing would apply in the second constituency, in the third, the fourth, all the way up to 51. So you're getting 34% of the vote in 51 seats, which is around 17, a little bit over 17% um, of the vote. In the seats that you lose in the 49, you don't get any support. You get zero. You don't need to. The other two parties can split that. And in the example here, the blue party is getting 51%. The gray party is getting 49%. So the blue party wins every single one of those 49 seats. So think about the overall distribution here. It really is, actually you might say it's crazy, but this is the, the fundamental logic of the system. And what we're going to do is show you how this actually works in particular elections. In the elections that we're familiar with, that is in the United States and, uh, and, and in the UK. So what do we have? We have the red party that's just getting over 17%, 34% of the vote in 51 seats. That's 17% of the overall vote in 51 seats. We have the blue party, which is getting 33% in 51 seats, nothing gets nothing for that, and 51% in the 49. So it's getting 49 seats. And think about the poor Grey Party. What's the Grey Party getting? Well, it's getting no seats. It has not a single representative, but it did get 49% of the vote in 49 seats. That's about 25% of the vote, a little less. And it gets 33% of the vote in 51 seats. I haven't figured out right now what the total vote for the Grey Party is, but it's a very bad deal because it is actually receiving 
um, around 25% um, 20, of the vote, and he gets no representation um, at, at all. So let's go through the answer. Um, and this is a series of logical uh, statements that summarizes the argument so far. So in a plurality system, a party needs to have a bare plurality of the vote to win a seat. That's the logic of the plurality electoral system. If three parties are competing, as we saw before, 34% of the vote will win you that seat. If the other two parties get precisely 33%, or roughly 33% each. So, logically, all a party needs to do to get a majority in a legislature is to win 51% of the seats. That's obvious. And so the answer, given the, this distribution of the vote, is 34% of the vote in 51% of the seats. That is slightly more than 17% of the vote. It's an artificial example, but what it does do, it, it, it illustrates the logic of a plurality electoral system. And here now, let's take a look at a particular example. Let's take the British general election, the last one in December of 2019. And what do we see here? Well, the left-hand column is the proportion of the votes that each of the major um, parties received in the United Kingdom. So, the Conservative Party got just over 40%, 43.6% of the seats. It got a majority, got 56.2% of the seats. So its seats were um, located in constituencies where it could pip the post, where it could actually become first. The Labour Party, 32% of the votes, just over, and 40% of the seats. It has areas in, in Britain, um, particularly in the Midlands and the North, in the cities particularly, and around London, where it is the majority party, even though it rarely gets more than 50% of the votes in any of those uh, constituencies. And then look at the Liberal Democrats. That's the third party. 7.4% of the votes. Very few seats. 1.8% of the seats. Imagine that you got 7.4% of the votes across the country. You wouldn't get any seats. 7.4% will never win you a seat. So there were a few places where the Liberal Democrats did actually have a plurality of the, uh, of the vote, mainly in the edges of the United Kingdom in the western and parts of, uh, of the north. But look at the Scottish Nationalists. 3% of the votes, 5.4% of the seats. So it gets less than half of the vote of the Liberal Democrats, um, about 40%, and it gets more than double the seats. Why? And let me just kind of stop there for a minute and let you think about the um, answer to that. And um, I'll come back and see if you can figure out why the Scottish Nationalists, on the basis of a smaller share of the vote, got a greater share of representation in um, the House of Commons. Well, the answer is that the Scottish Nationalists, all their votes were concentrated in Scotland. And so they were able to pass the post first to get a plurality of the vote in more constituencies than did um, the Liberal Democrats. There's a principle here, and it's worth remarking on. And the principle is that in a plurality electoral system, the territorial distribution of the vote is absolutely um, crucial. And you see that also in the next party, the Democratic Unionists of, um, of Ireland. 0 0.9, less than 1% of the votes. You'd think, well, are they ever going to get any representation? Yet, they have around nine seats in the House of Commons, 1.5% um, of the seats. And the same thing applies to Plaid Cymru, that is the Welsh Nationalist Party, they have a half a percent of the votes, and they actually do slightly better than that in terms of the percentage um, of um, the seats. 
Now, um, let's take a look at um, the United States. And here on uh, the screen is the Electoral College votes of Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump in the last presidential um, election in this country. What's going on here? Think about the logic of the system here. So Hillary Clinton has slightly less than 3 million more votes than Donald Trump in the United States as a whole. And yet she lost the election. Donald Trump had 304 electors and Hillary Clinton just 227. Now the answer probably, you know, in retrospect, it's going to be obvious to you. It's the Electoral College. It's a set of constituencies, jurisdictions in the United States, states, in which the vote is collected. So Hillary Clinton did, you know, wonderfully in California. But every extra vote that she received in California made no difference at all to her Electoral College um, score, her vote, the number of electors that she could summon. And Donald Trump just won several states in the Midwest. Several of these bat so-called battleground states um, went to Donald Trump by small margins of the, um, of the vote. So it's the, it's the location. It's the territorial location of the vote that is so important in a plurality electoral system. And the Electoral College is capable of transforming a minority of the vote, a losing election in some, in some sense, to a majority in the um, Electoral College. And the same thing happened in the previous, in the election of, of uh, Al Gore and George Bush of 2000. Not the previous election, but a couple of elections back. Um, well, um, while Gore received a majority of the, uh, a plurality of the vote overall in the United States, 48.4%, he received less um, electors. And um, if you speak to your parents, they may remember that uh, Florida was so, um, so decisive, which was turned on just a, a handful, just a, um, a few um, hundred um, votes, where it wasn't quite possible to see exactly how people voted. This was the Chad, you know, issue. Were people marking this correctly? Could, the, uh, could people detect exactly what people's intentions um, were? And so it ha hung on a, on, a, uh, on a thread. But uh, George Bush won the election and Albert Gore, just like Clinton, accepted the, accepted the outcome because they conceived of these as the rules of the game and uh, they, they accepted the legitimacy um, of the result. But you'll see something interesting in this particular slide, and that is um, Rolf Nader. Rolf Nader got 2.7% of the vote. He didn't get any electors. But what was the effect of Rolf Nader? Well, Rolf Nader picked up votes that would otherwise have gone to, to Gore. Rolf, Rolf Nader was an environmental green candidate. Gore was an environmentally conscious candidate, far more so than George Bush. So essentially, Ralph Nader, what he did is he, by pulling votes away from Bush, from, sorry, from Gore, um, he um, gave the election to George Bush. That's often the role of a third party in US um, elections. There is a different way of organizing elections, and it's called proportional representation. Um, where the proportion of the votes are fairly truthfully translates in the proportion of seats in a legislature. Um, so here you see the results for Germany. The last elections took place in September 2017. And when you compare the, the column on the left and, and the one on the right, so the left you have the percentage of votes and then in the seats, you see that there, there are few discrepancies that essentially the 30.29% of the vote for the CDU, the Christian Democratic Party, we, um, in, which is a, the major party in, in Germany, translated in 34.7% of the seats. So there's a bit of a kind of additional bonus, particularly for the larger parties. You see that as well with the Social Democrats, the second party there. But it's by and large roughly similar.
There is some difference though, and that comes out of the very particular nature of the German uh, application of proportional representation. And so the key difference there is that you get a, for a party to get into the, in the, in the legislature, it needs to gain at least 5% of the vote nationwide. So any party that gets less just doesn't count, just is t put aside, and the votes that, that, that were given to that party are redistributed to other parties. You could say, how do you do redistribute these votes? Well, this is because of a second peculiar feature of the German system. In Germany, when you cast your vote, you don't cast one vote, you cast actually two votes for the legislature. Your first vote is something we are quite familiar with, this is a constituency vote. You vote for a candidate in your constituency. It's actually a first-past-the-post element in the electoral system in Germany. The second vote you cast for a party and that, that kind of percentage of the, and, and that second vote is then added up nationally to calculate how, what percentage of of um, what percentage of seats the party is going to get in the national election. So you see that perhaps clearly when you look at the ballot. And again from 2017, on the left you see uh, names of candidates and underneath their party affiliation. That's your first vote. So you, you choose one of these candidates. But then on the right hand side you can cast the second vote. And here you cast a vote for a party, not for a candidate. So what that allows you to do, if you so decide as a voter, is some split ticket voting. You might actually vote, say, for a social democratic candidate uh, on the left, but then vote for, say, the Christian Demo Democratic Party on the right. So what is going to determine the overall percentage of votes in the legislature is the second vote. That's the PR element. However, any person who gets a plurality of the vote on the first vote is going to go automatically in the parliament. So they have to adjust. So it's an adjustment kind of mechanism. You see half of the seats are determined by a plurality. And then the second half are organized such that the overall distribution of the seats is given by the second vote by your vote for a political party. So they have to simply adjust the, the who, who gets in on the second uh, overall by virtue of the second vote. So it's the second vote that kind of that really matters. Yeah. And the first vote that is kind of a symbolic representation where you can actually have somebody who represents you as an individual by virtue of a plurality in particular constituencies, not the country um, as a whole. Now, the PR system does have a, a major drawback. Um, if you have a, a fairly pure PR system, proportional representation, you may end up with uh, loads of political parties in a legislature. Um, you see here um, the, the, the representation in the Dutch parliament. There are, in, represented in the parliament, 13 <laughs> political parties. Each dot, uh, each color, represents a different party. And um, that is because there's 150 seats in the parliament. Um, you, um, so a party can actually get elected. It's a pure electoral system. There's only one constituency. It's the entire Netherlands. So a party can get elected, can, can get a seat if it gets 0.6% of the vote. So this is what you get. And, and as a result of that, what you might see in a PR system, uh, perhaps more extreme parties, because they can get elected and get into the legislature. It can make coalition negotiations quite a bit. Uh, it took the Dutch um, government 209 days to get its, um, the, the, the exactly 75 seats together, so a, a, a majority, just a majority in the parliament, to get the government up and running. Four political parties had to combine and negotiate for such a time. So that is something to consider. It is, certainly is. And it means that, you know, whatever the, um, the drawbacks of a plurality electoral system, you can't turn around and say, look, PR is the 
a superior way of, of going about it. Each one of these systems has uh, advantages and, uh, and drawbacks. Um, what um, we'd like to do now, though, is to turn to a particular uh, drawback or potential drawback of a plurality um, electoral system. And what you see on the screen here is a, um, a summary of gerrymandering, um, which is um, a way of organising districts such that your followers, your political party, gets the bulk of representation. Um, and we've seen that the territorial um, um, articulation, the ter territorial distribution of votes is so important in terms of whether a party gets more than its share or less than its share um, of seats relation, in relation to its share of the votes. Well, this can be done intentionally. It can be done as a, as a strategy. And here on the slide, are four uh, tactics which uh, summarise this strategy. That's cracking, spreading voters of a type among many districts so they cannot capture a single, uh, e.g. urban area split, among, split up among suburban areas. Um, the idea is that if you spread your opponents such that they never quite achieve a plurality in any one constituency, then those votes are essentially wasted. Packing concentrating as many voters of one type into a single electoral district to reduce their influence in other districts. So cracking and packing go together. You pack your opponent's <coughs> voters in one district and then spread the rest among the remaining districts. And so they gain that one packed district, but not uh, the numerous cracked districts. And then hijacking, redrawing two districts so that you force the two incumbents of the same political party to run against each other in the same district. And then finally, kidnapping, moving areas where an elected official has significant support to another district. So that person has to create a new constituency, a new coalition to seek to win that uh, district um, in, the, in the future. And this is a simple uh, representation of um, how this, how packing and cracking uh, can work. Here we have just simply four districts <clears throat> and one of them is packed. So the green voters have been packed into District 1 and District 1 then returns a, a green representative to the legislature. But wow, I mean, it's 180 votes out of 200 total. You didn't need that many votes to, to do that. And that allows the remaining green voters to be cracked to be spread across the remaining districts so that the yellow party, the yellow voters, gain the bulk of representation, in this case three seats against the green um, one um, seat. And here is a, is a picture of North Carolina and the constituencies. And what you see in the bottom left is the old circumstance of constituencies um, that was there in uh, 2016. And these are the congressional uh, districts. And when you look closely at that uh, insert in the, in the bottom left of, that, uh, of this slide, you can see evidence of gerrymandering. Whenever you see districts that are shaped in like a gerrymander, like a salamander, like some strange um, animal, as you see in this, uh, as you see in this, uh, um, this photograph, um, you see um, evidence of gerrymandering. And what you see in the upper right is the, um, the current uh, setup. And you see some evidence of gerrymandering because it's very clear that the counties which are marked in uh, with the black um, jurisdictional boundaries um, have been split up in ways that would facilitate a majority for the ruling party that set the constituency boundaries in North uh, um, Carolina, uh, the Republican uh, Party. And so in the old system of 2016, the, uh, the Democrats had roughly the same number of votes, proportion of the vote, that the Republicans, and the Republicans received 10 members in, um, in the House, in Congress, and the Democrats received three. So it was 10 to 3 on the basis of that particular pattern of uh, constituency, the design of constituencies. 
and in the upper right it, will, it is now narrowed because the uh, North Carolina Supreme Court and the Supreme Court of the US um, compelled the, um, these districts to be uh, redrawn in a slightly fairer way and um, it would be on the basis of the vote of 2016 it would be just eight Republicans vis-a-vis -vis five uh, Democrats. We said we were going to think comparatively, so let's turn to another plurality system, uh, Britain. And there, the drawing of the boundaries, we now know is critical, a critical element there, is done differently. It's done by a boundary commission, Boundary Commission of England, BCE, which is non-partisan in composition. In fact, it's composed of judges, uh, civil servants, um, who then set um, every so often, at regular intervals, the boundaries or redraw, if necessary, the boundaries of the of the electoral constituencies. And you see there on the screen the the, the, the key characteristics. I mean, let me just point out some. Uh, one thing that's absolutely uh, important in in the boundaries consideration is to keep as much as possible the local gov government boundaries um, as they are. So it wouldn't be possible in the, in the UK, for example, to split up a county uh, over several electoral districts. Um, and then on top of that, they would, there is the, um, roughly the same number of voters in each of the, of the districts and, and essentially try to maintain as much as possible equivalent shape of the jurisdictions. So you couldn't easily get salamanders in, in the UK system. But the key difference with the US system, or at least most US states, is that the, the, the drawing of the boundaries is a non-partisan process. Yeah. All right, um, let's, um, let's, ask some, let's pose some basic questions that summarize the logics of these two um, electoral systems. And first of all, and um, <laughs> let me ask you, yes. um, why are there two and only two major political parties in the United States? Well, the key answer is because the United States has a plurality system. And so this is a first-past-the-post system, sometimes also called winner-takes-all. So that really discourages minor parties to run. Yes, if, you, if you're running as a minor party, you could hurt one of the major parties. And the strange thing is, which party do you, do you hurt? The party that you'd otherwise prefer. Yeah. That you would have voted for if there would be no third party. Yeah. So there is one exception where, in a plurality system, you may get third parties quite easily, and, and Gary has talked about and in the context of the UK. That is where there is a distinctive community that is territorially concentrated, that lives in its own separate area, its own separate world. Then it could make sense for a third party to run independently from the major Yes, parties. but not in a presidential election, for not sure. Not in a presidential election. Because it's, you know, it's going to take all for the country as a whole. Yes. So that really does suppress, which is not to say that there have been a lot of third parties in America. There have been um, actually more than a thousand third parties that have run in America. Um, but if you were thinking about, you know, how would you develop, if, if you don't like a, if you're not a Democrat, imagine that you're not a Democrat, you're not a Republican. Let's say you are a Green. What would you do? Well, you'd, you'd operate in the primary system. So the primary system, you can... You can operate with any party label in the primary system because the primaries are open. And so in, in the past, socialists, we talked about the socialists um, last time. Why is there no socialist party in the United States? Well, the socialists always insisted on running as a third party. They always insisted and they didn't want to have anything to do uh, with the major parties. They didn't take a political science course, I guess. They didn't take a political science course. They were so ideologically pure that they self-defeated. Um, except for one. There were some socialists who said, look, I'm, not, I'm just not going to go with this. I'm going to break from the Socialist Party. A person called Townsend did this following World War I. And what did he do? He ran as a Republican huh? in South Dakota and won and South Dakota had a whole series of socialists under the Republican Party label. They nationalized the mills. They did lots of things that socialists wanted them to do. But the Socialist Party didn't accept it. They, were, they wanted to be ideologically pure. And in the US system, ideological purity 
comes at the cost of effectiveness. And you have to, um, before the, um, the, the actually the, the, the Gore um, um, Bush election that I just showed you a little while ago, um, I'd written the book Why Is There No Socialist in America, had co authored this, um, which was about how the socialists had failed. And I was asked on National Public Radio to give one of these editorials about the Greens. And in that editorial, I turned around and said, look, the Greens are going to hurt the candidate that they would not otherwise most want to win, Gore. And I gave that right before the election. And what happened in Florida? The Greens took away the votes that would have allowed Gore to win the um, election. Now, there is a Green Party um, in contesting battleground states in the United States in the coming election. And so let's see if the Greens then are able to deliver uh, Trump the election by virtue of taking votes um, away from, from Biden. Now, what are then the consequences of a party split in each of these systems? What do you think the consequences of a party split are? In PR, doesn't matter. If you can overcome the barrier, which in Germany is 5%, in other countries it can be lower. In as... some countries there is no barrier. Um, in the Netherlands there is no barrier. So you, in the Netherlands you actually can get a seat in the, in the national parliament with 0.6% of the vote nationwide. Yes. That's the minimum you need to get. So as long as you have 06 so imagine that there, there's a party of 10%. And it splits into two, 5% each. Well, each one of those parties will get 5% of the, of the, of the seats. <coughs> there's, no, there's no loss. So if you remember in the last two lectures, the point of departure was that in Europe there are a lot of political parties. Well, there is a two-letter explanation for that. PR, proportional representation, where you can split, have small parties, you don't lose. Under plurality... Suicide. Imagine a party that had 60% support and the other party had just 40%. But the party of 60% splits into two parties of 30%. Well, both of those parties would lose. The party of 40% would then gain representation. They'd win the presidency. And you see this actually at work while we speak in this election in the Republican Party where there is a minority of Republican leaders who are discontented with the main line of the current Republican Party. And they're not running as an independent party. No. Of course, the Democrats would love them to, because it would give the Democrats the, um, the election. And within the Democratic Party, um, Sanders is determined not to split to the party, to try to deliver his support in the primaries uh, to, uh, to Biden, precisely because it's a plurality um, electoral system. So one question would be, imagine the United States uh, with PR, yeah. that we switch to PR. What parties would emerge? Well, I mean, let me ask you, what parties do you think would emerge wow. in the United States well, if we had PR? I think we would have a kind of mm, uh, mainstream center-right Republican Party. You'd get a party around President Trump, which would be... To which would be right a TAN party. Process, which would be a TAN party in the, in the language that we talked about, the European language. You would get probably a center-left Democratic Party. Then, but you'd also get, I think, a radical left oh, party. Oh, you would, you would. Sanders would have his own yes. um, party. Yeah. There would be a party, it would be a socialist party. You'd actually get something that wouldn't be so different from the situation in the European Parliament. Exactly. It would actually be that you get a libertarian party. I mean, you'd get a lot of different parties in the United States. Because the same kind of ideological tensions are present in our society than they are in Europe. Yeah. It's just that the electoral system forces us voters, but particularly the party, the politicians, to think and act differently, if you want to be effective. Um, well, I think we've answered this question already. Ah. Um, what about minor parties? Right. What is the fate of minor parties under plurality or under um, PR? Well, in plurality system, they're marginalised. They can be spoilers, right? They can just actually help decide they are 
they least like because they typically tend to bite into the support base of the major party that is closer to their agenda. So why did Democrats in, in the history of New York politics try to support an alternative Republican party to have two candidates? Why did Republicans support a Labour party alongside the Democratic party? Because they wanted to split the opposition. The strongest supporter of, let's imagine, that someone like Bernie Sanders would want to create another party, where would he get his support from, say financially? From a Republican donor, it would, the same thing would operate, um, changing the party names, yeah. who would say, look, I'd like to support this party because it would split the opposition. That's the logic. There's one exception that you mentioned to, um, the, to minor parties under plurality, and that is you can operate under plurality if you have concentrated support, yes. like the Scottish Nationalists, or like the Welsh Nationalists, or like the Democratic Unionists. Or in Canada, like the Quebec Separatists. Yes. If you can win, if you've got your support territorially concentrated, then you can actually get representation, even if you have a minority in the country as a whole. Yeah. And then you're actually very difficult to dislodge. Indeed. Yes. So on the PR system, it's quite different. Right. Um, in terms of minor parties. Yes, you're not hurt. You've got to reach the threshold. Yeah. In Germany, you've got to get to that 5%, otherwise you have wasted your vote. Um, but that aside, it doesn't hurt. Yeah. Now, how does coalition building work then in each of these systems? So this is kind of extending the logic of the electoral system to government, how governments are formed. Because essentially that's why we need the vote, right, in order to vote parties or uh, uh, candidates in power so they can govern us. Yes. How does coalition building work? Well, you can see how it works under peer. Look, in, you, to, to get a government, you've got to have a majority in the legislature. Under PR, are you going to get majorities for one party in the legislature? Rarely, if at all. Almost never happens. Because the parties, you get more smaller parties. So what they have to do is they've got to create coalitions in the legislature. So that, so you get the election, you get a variety of parties, and then the Greens turn around and say, well, let's create a coalition with the Socialists, Social Democrats, and maybe we'll include the Liberals or some other party, or the Conservatives, or we'll turn around and say, well, let's see what we can do in terms of creating a coalition. You got, they try to get a majority in the legislature to support the parliament. There is an interesting role there, potentially, often for minor parties, for the smaller parties, because they can often deliver the critical additional votes to get over the 50%. Yes, yeah. And there is a phrase that is often used when uh, in Europe coalition negotiations are ongoing, the kingmakers. It's the ones that actually huh, can make the difference. Yes. And they tend to be smaller parties. Yes, you've got to get over that 50% to get a majority in the legislature to run the government. Under plurality, it's a different logic. You've got to create your coalition prior to the election. Yeah. You've got to create one coalition, particularly in the United States, at the presidential level. So what the parties are trying to do is a combination of two things. One, they're trying to reach out to voters who might be switchers. They may be unidentified. And two, they've got to get their own constituency out on election day or perhaps, if we're lucky, a mailing um, prior to election day. And they've got to create a sufficient proportion of voters that they can win enough electoral college votes to um, get, succeed into the presidency. So the negotiations in a plurality system are most within the parties. The negotiations in a PR system are mostly between the parties. Well, that's the last word of this lecture. I hope you've enjoyed it. and. Um, um, and next time we're going to, uh, to have a discussion of some of the virtues and vices. And there are virtues and vices on both sides yeah. of these uh, systems.